saying, my friend Joe, what a what a different experience this is for me. I uh, it's all so fancy here in California. <laughs> I live in Pennsylvania in Amish Mennonite country, and I'm a Quaker. Uh, and so our service, our church service, is a little different than this. <clears throat> Uh, we don't meet in a church auditorium, I mean a school auditorium. We uh, have a meeting house that was built in 1798. It was a gift of William Penn. And uh, we don't have any music or musical instruments. Uh, we don't have a pastor either. We just sit in silence for an hour. You should try it sometime. It's, it's a lot cheaper, I don't know. <laughs> I am very pleased to be here, and I'm very pleased to uh, Pastor Dan and for June for, for raising my name as a possible person to come and speak. And for those who don't know you, it's really hard to explain what I do for a living uh, in that it's not a traditional job. Uh, I am a, a Bible scholar, I'm a comic, I'm a performance artist, I'm a human rights activist, and often I'm all those things put together in one fell swoop. Uh, and, and so I speak at seminaries, high schools, gay clubs, conferences throughout North America, Europe, and parts of Africa, talking about lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer issues, often around faith, often around the Bible. And I know that these topics are often really hot to handle for lots of different communities. And even for those of us who are lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, or queer, that it can be complicated, particularly with the mix of faith. And the Bible gets really complicated because often the people we loved most in life have used the Bible to beat the snot out of us. And then we have to do defensive theology and, and try to say, no, 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 we're really not these horrible, scary people that you think we are. Uh, and, and there's work to be done often to convince others and to convince ourselves often. I don't know about you, but uh, I'm, not, I'm sure there's some people who like me. Uh, when I became a born again Christian at age 17, I did not want to be gay. In fact, that's one of the reasons why I turned to Jesus to de-gay me. <laughs> I went straight to Jesus. And I, I know it's early. Uh, and I spent 17 years and over $30,000 on three continents attempting to de-gay myself. Uh, I even spent two years in the notorious Love in Action program in Memphis, Tennessee. And after all of that, I definitely did not change my sexuality. I did change, though, not in the ways that I wanted. I became depressed and confused, suicidal, uh, and, and really questioning about faith. Uh, in the end, I determined that hair can be straightened. Gays, not so much. <laughs> and so then I came out of the closet. Uh, which wasn't a triumphant exit. It was more like accepting the reality, like, okay, I'm gay, now what do I do? And although I was out of the closet, I wasn't necessarily free. I was very much like Lazarus, Jesus' friend who Jesus raises from the dead, who comes out of the tomb, and he's wrapped up in all the burial clothes. He's sort of like a, a walking mummy. Uh, and he comes out, and, and he's like, hops out of the tomb, and he's like, He can't see anything. There's a face cloth over his face. He's all bound up. And Jesus says, take off the grave clothes and let him go. And so much for, for many of us who were afraid of ourselves, we come from oppressive backgrounds. It took us a little while to accept who we were. We often come out of the closet bound up in grave clothes of fear and shame, and we need people to come alongside of us and to help us to unwrap ourselves. Now for me, like I'm sure for some people here, I knew I was different from an early age. And it wasn't because I was falling in love with boys or had crushes on boys, it was because I was different from other boys. I mean, I played Cowboys and Indians and Planets of the Apes, Planet of the Apes, which was big when I was a kid. But I also liked to play house and played with my sister's Barbies and the Easy Bake Oven. 
So I was different from the other boys. In fact, my, one of my first memories as a child was my parents and my uncle bought a boat together, a little cabin cruiser to go up and down the Hudson River. And there's a sleeping cabin and there's the deck. In the sleeping cabin, my uncle put up some curtains, these little white lacy curtains. I'm sure they were polyester. But in my four-year-old brain, they were the most beautiful things I had ever seen in my life. The sun was shimmering on them, and I just wanted to touch them. Because I assumed they would have felt wonderful, soft and silky. And so in a daze, I'm like going over to reach and touch this wonderful, beautiful fabric when all of a sudden, whoosh, my uncle, Bobby, who, like my dad, was a Marine, US Marine from the Bronx, he says, what are you doing? Don't put your filthy hands on those curtains. I was like, filthy hands on those curtains? Or, you know, I'm thinking, I would never do that. And I realized, even at that age, oh my gosh, I'm kind of different from other boys. And what was different, I was different in the way I expressed my gender. I was a boy, but not like other boys. And so in a way, I was a sissy before I was a fag <laughs> in other people's minds. And so I've done a lot of scholarship in the Bible around issues having to do with us. And, and there are lots of people doing really good stuff about gay theology, taking on the clobber passages, looking for gay characters in the Bible, like, whoa, David and Jonathan, they were gay. Which, you know, people have heard the story about maybe David and Jonathan being gay. They were, had a very intimate, passionate relationship that was physical even. Now, I think you'd have to be more honest and say, though, that David was probably bisexual because he liked the ladies. There's no question about that. Uh, but it's nice to see the potential of these possible gay characters. But I, I thought, let me just skip over gay for a moment. Lots of people are doing that. The Bible has very, very, very specific rules having to do with gender. How boys are supposed to act, how girls are supposed to act. Gender roles, gender presentation. So it's not really that difficult to see when someone is misbehaving. So I went to the scriptures with my gender lenses on. And my gender lenses look something like this. <laughs> I think I got them from Elton John. <laughs> and I asked the critical question, who in the text is transgressing and transcending gender? Who is breaking the rules around gender and who is rising above them? And what I discovered is that the most important people in some of the most important Bible stories are gender non-conforming. And they're either people I'd never noticed before or people that were right in front of my eyes, but I was trained to look away from certain parts of them. And this morning, if you're interested, I'd like to share with you some of that scholarship that I have. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Audience participation is really nice, yeah. Uh, and when I say scholarship, don't, though, don't think, oh, Lord have mercy, a boring lecture. I'm a comic and I'm an actor, so often I will act out these things for us and become different beings. Now, we're looking at gender nonconforming people in the Bible. One of the first stops is probably eunuchs. You've heard of the eunuchs? Not the operating system, <laughs> eunuchs. It's more modern. But in the ancient world, there were a class of people known as eunuchs. These were non-procreative males, men who were male-bodied people who couldn't have children. And, and there were a variety of different types of eunuch, but the most traditional type of eunuch was a castrated male, a boy, male-bodied person who, before puberty, was castrated and so lost the ability to produce testosterone. This is really important because unlike other boys, these folks didn't go through puberty. They were male-bodied, but they retained high voices. They didn't get facial hair and beard. They didn't get the body hair, the muscles that come with testosterone, the prominent brow after years of testosterone. They looked and sounded different from the men and women around them. They were another sex, another gender, not male, not female, something in the middle or altogether different. Now this is important because when we read the text, we just say eunuch, eunuch, whatever. No, 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 stop. 
This is a sexual minority. This is a gender different person that would have stood out in society. And there are many eunuchs in the Bible. In the Hebrew scriptures alone, the Old Testament, there are over 45 references to 45 different eunuchs or potential eunuchs in the Bible. And one of the things that we don't all know who are eunuchs is the Hebrew word for eunuch is saris, which is the same word for official. So anytime when you're reading your Bible and it says an official of the court, it also can be interpreted a eunuch of the court. And I want to tell you a eunuch story, if I may. As I said, I was a sissy before I was a fag. And uh, I find it is really important for me to tap into that sissy part of me. There's some power there. So I want to tell you a story that many of you may know. It's the story of Queen Esther. You know, people like queen stories, right? We like the queen stories. And the thing about Queen Esther, sometimes when we look at these stories, um, the most important people are often the most invisible. Oh, <laughs> you have come at the perfect time. No, it's been absolutely crazy here in the court of Xerxes, the king. Xerxes, that's his Persian name. You probably call him something different. Most people do. <laughs> no, it's absolutely insane. And of course, it was up to the eunuchs to fix everything because that's what we do. I am a eunuch here in King Xerxes' court. Ironically, they call me he guy. <laughs> it's my Persian name. <laughs> The trouble started about seven years ago. Xerxes got into his head that he wanted to have this blowout party and invite everyone who is anyone from his entire kingdom, which extends from India to Ethiopia, size queen that he is. <laughs> of course, it was up to the eunuchs to make the magic happen, because that's what we do. They put me in charge of decorations, oh, the banners, the tapestries, the hanging gardens. <laughs> They're going to talk about this party for a long time. The celebration lasted for a full six months, because here in Persia, when we party, we don't play. <laughs> and it was a huge success, so much so that once we packed everyone up and cleaned the place, Xerxes decided to have a second celebration to honor all of the officials in the court, from the lowest to the highest, and I am, of course, one of the highest. Now, this celebration lasted for seven days. And on the last day of the celebration, Xerxes was with his drinking buddies drunk off his royal throne when he summoned me to his side. Yes, mighty, exalted, and highly inebriated Xerxes, how may I serve my king? Oh. He wanted me to go into the harem to fetch Vashti, the queen. She's gorgeous. He wanted her to come, and he wanted to show her off to some of his male guests. Well, I tried to explain to him that Vashti's not into that whole thing, but ugh, you cannot talk sense to the king. So being a eunuch, as I am, I have pretty much unfettered access into every part of the palace, including the women's quarters. I guess they figure that since I'm technically weaponless, <laughs> that somehow I'm not interested. And we'll let them continue to think that now, won't we? So I went right into the harem, went straight up to the queen. Oh, Vashti, darling, huge problem with the king. What's that? Yes, he's been drinking again. I know, we've got to do that whole intervention thing you've been telling me about. Now, here's the deal. The king would like you to do a walkthrough. In, out, five minutes. You don't have to say a word. She would have none of it. She said, I am no plaything to be dangled in front of these men. I've got a heart, I've got a mind, I've got ideas for this kingdom. And I totally agreed with her. I just didn't think it was the best political move to make. So I asked her, Vashti, sweetheart, is that your final answer? <laughs> so being the eunuch, I had to be the bearer of bad news, which can prove fatal. Oh, mighty, exalted, and unbelievably kind and compassionate Xerxes, Got a little problem with Vashti. Um, she's temporarily indisposed, and poof, he exploded, rageaholic that he is, crying for her head. It took us three days to calm him down. Sadly, Vashti was stripped of her crown, banished from the kingdom. 
So for the next few weeks, I was completely consumed with the queen, packing her things, finding her a place to stay. Oh, but don't worry about Vashti. She's going to be fine. She's very resourceful. In fact, I've encouraged her to write a book about her experiences here in the palace. So as I was busy with the queen, I begin to get troubling reports about the king. He's lonely, he's confused, he's depressed. Without his queen, he doesn't know who he is. Please. So I got together with some of the other eunuchs, and we came up with this amazing plan that we pitched to the king. Almighty, exalted, and really sad and downtrodden looking Xerxes. <laughs> We, your royal units, would love to scour your entire large kingdom in search of beautiful young women. When we have some finalists, we would like to present them to you. And you, King Xerxes, will decide who will be Persia's next top queen. <gasps> he loved it. He's all about the spectacle. And that's what we did. We went to every backwater place in this kingdom, and I nearly despaired. I mean, I saw beautiful women, don't get me wrong, but to be a queen, <laughs> take somebody special. But then I saw her, beautiful, bright-eyed, flawless complexion, young girl, no more than 16 or 17, by the name of Hadassah. I said, young lady, if you like, there just might be a place in the palace for you. She said, yes. I brought her here, hand-picked her handmaidens, because you've got to be careful around here. And I put her on my own personal diet and beauty regime. I prepared her for the big reveal. Now, the thing is, being a eunuch as I am, <laughs> the men of the court, well, they don't treat me like one of the boys, no. In fact, they often come to me looking for advice, a shoulder to cry on, and they often tell, ask me for advice and tell me their secrets, their sexual secrets. Oh, yeah. I could just be sitting in the garden minding my own business when some page or general or governor comes by and says, hey, he guy, you know what I've always wanted to try? To which I always respond, no, I really don't want to know. <laughs> but they always tell me, and let me tell you, some of these guys, freaks. <sighs> mm. But sometimes this can come in handy. One night, King Xerxes himself invited me to spend the evening with him in his private bedroom chambers alone. Not for anything like that, though. The king doesn't do eunuchs, although I've heard rumors. No, we just sat and knocked back a couple of flasks of wine. And somewhere in the middle of the night, the king leans in and he says, hey, he guy. You know what I've always wanted? I would love it if some woman would just burst in here and blah, 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 blah. <gasps> he told me his deepest, darkest, freakiest sexual fantasy. And I thought, you know what? I'm going to store this one away. This one, this one can come in handy one day. And sure enough, the day came. The day when Esther was summoned to appear before King Xerxes. No, 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 no. No, sweetheart, you have nothing to worry about. You are gorgeous. We have changed your name to Esther. You're very Persian looking. Um, your, your skin looks great. And, and the beauty routine that I've done on you has worked wonders. You're going to be fine. But when you go into the king's private bedroom chamber, I want you to bring only what I tell you. Nothing more, nothing less. So bring with you this feather, <laughs> this leather strap, <laughs> oh yes, <laughs> and this over-ripened mango. Trust me, it'll all make sense. <laughs> okay, you go in there, you have a good time. Don't worry about anything. And that's when I worried about everything. I mean, I'd been getting closer to the king, and if he had selected Esther as his queen, well, it would be very good for my career. I had nothing to worry about. First thing in the morning, Xerxes comes bounding out of his chambers, puts his bare paw around me and says, hey, he guy, that Esther of yours, she just blew in here last night and blah, 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 blah. However did she know? <laughs> <laughs> so Esther became Queen Esther. And then, uh, and then all hell broke loose. Because turns out she's part of some minority population. We're very inclusive here in the kingdom. But some high official in the court doesn't, didn't like her people and passed an edict to utterly destroy them. How do these laws even get passed? 
<laughs> so being the eunuch, I had to go to the harem and talk to the queen, had to go out of the palace, talk to some uncle or cousin of hers, had to go to the king's people. I set up some lunches. We smoothed the whole thing over, because that's what we do. Some heads had to roll, but that's how they solve problems around here. But the important thing is she is firmly in her place. He is firmly in his place. And I, <laughs> for you see, behind every great monarchy, there is a he guy. <laughs> We recognize the sissy character. It's been in, uh, in uh, plays and it's been in movies since you know, the turn of the last century. Uh, and so I played that character as a sissy character. But what's so interesting about that character and a similar character in the book of Daniel, they're there to help Daniel and Esther become great, to do this work. And without their help, the whole stories fall apart. Without the eunuchs in the Book of Esther, and there are 12 eunuchs named, all different roles. Some are assassins, some are military leaders, all different folks. Uh, without those folks, that whole story falls apart. And that's really critical because this gender nonconforming person is smack dab in the center of this important story. Now, a lot of people know about a famous eunuch in the New Testament, the Christian scriptures, the Ethiopian eunuch. Raise your hand if you've ever heard of the Ethiopian eunuch. Yeah, growing up and going to First Catholic Church and Evangelical churches and more Pentecostal churches, this story was always told to me as a delivery system for Jesus. All right? It really wasn't about the eunuch. In fact, I had no idea what this person looked like. Uh, the way this story was told, it's just Ethiopian eunuch, blah, 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 Jesus, 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 blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, wait, stop. As an actor, as a playwright, I'm interested in people's bodies in their skin tone, in their nationality, in their ethnicity, even in their genitals. I'm interested in their bodies because this is important to me as a scholar to know as much about a character as possible. And what's fascinating in the book of Acts, chapter 8, the story of the Ethiopian eunuch, there are more descriptors for this one person in the New Testament than any other character in all of the New Testament except for Jesus. We find out that this is a black African surgically altered, gender variant, rich civil servant who is a person of faith. That one person contains all those identities. And this is one of the first converts to Christianity who goes back rejoicing to Ethiopia. And to this day, there are churches in Ethiopia that trace their roots back to this gender non-conforming queer person. Now, I recently in my scholarship, I discovered a second Ethiopian eunuch. A lot of people know about the Acts one, but there's actually another Ethiopian eunuch in the scriptures. This one in the Hebrew scriptures in the Old Testament. It's in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 38. Jeremiah is a prophet. I know, you thought he was a bullfrog. <laughs> but no, he was a prophet, actually. And he had a very unpopular message at the time, though. Basically, the Jewish people were going to be invaded and brought into exile. And he said, you know what? Just go with it. God says, don't fight it. Just go with it. And there were people like, no, no, no. We're going to fight. We're going to fight. And so Jeremiah wasn't very popular. The king didn't have a lot of power also. So the enemies of Jeremiah arrested him, put him into the into the. Uh, palace court into a prison cell, actually into a big deep well, a cistern, and left this old man, just dropped him down, they left this old man to die. And then, all of a sudden, coming on the scene is Ebed Malek. How many of you have ever heard of Ebed Malek? Didn't think so. Yes, we're not told about Ebed Malek because we just know about Jeremiah. Ebed Malek is an Ethiopian eunuch in the court. He's an official from Cush. Or Kush, he's a Kushite. He's an Ethiopian. He is a, just like the Ethiopian eunuch in Acts chapter 8, he's an Ethiopian eunuch and in a royal capacity. He goes to the king and says, listen, your servant Jeremiah, he's going to die. We've got to do something. And the king's like, well, you know, my hands are tied. I'm just kind of political right now. I really can't get involved. And the king says, I'll do this. I'll give you 30 men, 30 fighting men. Do what you can do. So Ebed Malek organizes this special ops, midnight Navy SEAL-like raid into the palace to rescue the prophet Jeremiah. And he's so 
intelligent and thoughtful, he not only gets ropes to pull up the prophet, but also old clothes. And he throws the old clothes down and he tells the prophet, put these under your arms so that when we pull you up, it doesn't hurt you, it doesn't harm you. And there in the middle of the night, under the watchful eye of all the other watchmen, they did this special operations rescue. And what we have in this text is a black African surgically altered gender variant savior. Not just a tolerated person, but someone absolutely essential. The story of Jeremiah would have ended if it wasn't for Ebed Malek. That person needs to be recognized and celebrated. Now, I'm going to tell you a story that most everybody knows. Uh, and it's a beautiful story, and I'm so glad for the scholarship I was able to bring out from it that most people don't know. Uh, it's the story of Joseph, not Jesus' daddy, but the other Joseph with the amazing Technicolor dream coat. How many of you know a little bit about the story, know something about the story? Raise your hand. So I'm not like just saying nothing that people don't know. Okay, so when we look at the story from gender perspectives, suddenly some interesting things emerge. And I'm going to just tell you the story through a scene that I do in my play, Transfigurations, Transgressing Gender in the Bible. And I will tell you the story from the perspective of Esau. Who is Esau? Jacob's brother. And Jacob is Joseph's father. So this is Joseph's uncle. What do we know about Esau? His, his body, his personality, his activities. What do we know? He's a hairy, rough man. He's a big, hairy, rough man. Recently, I was at Wesley Seminary. It was like this fancy seminary in DC. And I'm saying, what was, what was Esau like? And this wonderful guy in the back, this gay minister, he says, he was a bear. <laughs> <laughs> and he was. Uh, big, burly guy, hairy, I mean, like crazy hairy. Uh, and so, and, and Jacob was like kind of this girly boy, you know, didn't, you know, didn't have body hair, liked to dwell amongst the tents which is a euphemism in the ancient text to say he hung out with the ladies. And so I'm going to tell the story, but I'm going to tell it from the perspective of Esau. What's going on here? Did I flip? Okay. Is that better? All right. Yeah, I'm Esau. You probably know my brother Jacob, although he went and changed his name to Israel. Uh, Jacob and me were twins, although you'd never know it by looking at us. I mean, I'm a real man. I'm big, I'm hairy, always outdoors, doing real men's work. Well, my brother, well, he's smooth as a lady. Very sensitive growing up. He liked to dwell amongst the tents with the women. They're cooking, they're gossiping, they're scheming. He was a real girly boy. And since our father, Isaac, found me normal, he favored me. Now, the thing about my brother, Jacob, although he was a girly boy, he liked the ladies. Oh, yeah. He uh, had two wives and slept with both their handmaidens. And from those women, he had a pack of children's daughters, sons, strong, strapping young men, all of them except for one of his youngest, Joseph. <laughs> Joseph. This kid was trouble from the day he was born, always, always crying, clinging to his mother. And then when he got older, he'd have these dreams, these, these crazy dreams that he would tell us about. Listen, boys are not supposed to dream. So one day I pulled my brother aside and said, you need to toughen up this kid. You know, it's a rough world. They're just going to ride right over him. But does he listen to me? No indulges him, gives him everything he wants, including that robe. <laughs> now listen, you won't catch me dead in a robe like that. For one, too expensive for my taste, a royal garment, the kind of garment a king gives to his virgin daughter. Yes, it was a princess dress. My brother Jacob gave his son Joseph a princess dress, and that kid put that dress on and flitted about the compound like he was some kind of butterfly. And I thought, this is not going to end well. <laughs> sure enough, one day when the boys were out in the field doing real men's work, Jacob sent Joseph to go check on them. And that kid, no sense in his head, puts on the stupid dress, goes traipsing across the countryside, makes fools out of all of us. Well. 
his brothers, they, they saw him in a distance. Who could miss him in that getup? And they said, enough of this dreamer. And they rushed him. They threw him to the ground. They beat him black and blue. And they tried to beat some sense him. They tore off the stupid dress and, 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 and ripped it to pieces, defiled it in blood. They came back with a bloody garment and a story. How their brother was attacked by a wild beast and that that was all that remained. But later they pulled me aside, they told me the real story, how they bro sold their brother as a, as a slave to some traders going off to Egypt. And I thought, you know what? It may all be for the best. I mean, I'm a shepherd, I know. You got a weak lamb, you take it out. It's just gonna bring the rest of them down. And besides, the kid might do okay for himself there in Egypt land where they go in for that whole girly boy thing. Well, years go by and I didn't give him a second thought. And then we had that famine. Now, I've been through drought, famine, tons of times. You just got to be man enough to ride it out, but not this time. This time, it was like the earth was cursed against us year after year. It got so bad, we finally sent the boys to Egypt to get some grain, not to beg, mind you. We beg from no one. And they were brought before some official in Pharaoh's court. And at first, they couldn't tell what it was, a man or a woman with a headdress, the makeup, the flowing robes. Those Egyptians. Turns out, it was their very own brother, Joseph. Somehow this girly boy worked his way up through the ranks to become second in command of the whole kingdom. But, but they didn't recognize him under all that gunk. And this was Joseph's chance to get back at his brothers. Revenge for what they did. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. You don't let anyone ride over you. But does he? Yeah, not that girly boy. He goes off weeping like a woman. And then he comes back to try to teach his brothers a lesson. And then he, then he forgives them and he reconciles with them. He gives them food. He gives them shelter. He treats them like he's their sister or their mother, not like any man I've ever seen. And in so doing so, that girly boy, my nephew, Joseph, He saved us all. I don't know about you, I can't read the story of Joseph in the book of Genesis, or even see Joseph in the amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat without getting teary-eyed and even like weeping at parts. It's a very, very moving story and it's beautifully told. And, and and when we look at it from a gender perspective for a moment, it becomes a very interesting story. I mean, Jacob is a kind of a girly boy compared to Esau, and he has all these children. And then this one child he has later in life, Joseph, is a special son. And there's worries about inheritance rights. There's worries about jealousy. But at one point, Jacob gives Joseph a garment that opens up a Pandora's box, really makes things complicated. Now, if you look in almost any Bible commentary or study Bible, when it comes to that passage where the garment is, most often there's a note that says the exact meaning of the Hebrew word is unclear. But scholars don't really know what the garment was that Jacob gave Joseph, which is not that uncommon. I mean, Hebrew is an ancient language. We don't know everything about it. It's got a limited vocabulary. So if you're doing some scholarship, you ask, what was the word? And does it appear anywhere else? Perhaps you can give us some light. The word is actually a phrase. It's a ketonet pasim in Hebrew. So J J Joseph got a ketonet pasim from his father. And so does it appear anywhere else in the text? No. In the book of Genesis, the ketonet pasim is only referred to the garment that Joseph got that when his brother saw him in public, they tore up defiled in blood. So then you have to say, well, does it appear anywhere else? Does it appear anywhere else in the, in the Hebrew scripture? And yes, it appears in one other passage in 2 Samuel. It's a story of King David. It's actually a story of King David's daughter, Tamar. And it's a sad, tragic story of sexual violence and rape, and particularly what happens when a family doesn't deal with that properly. And in the story, Tamar is raped by her half-brother, and in the story, it talks about what the princess Tamar is wearing. Like Joseph, she too is wearing a ketonet pasim. 
And in Hebrew, it defines it for us, the garment worn by the virgin daughters of the king. It says it in the text, a princess dress. So I can just imagine a straight, heterosexual, gender normative, male scholar looking at the Genesis account, looking at the Second Samuel account, and concluding the exact meaning of the Hebrew word is unclear. <laughs> no, we have no idea. It could mean anything. No, that's not true. If you have any intellectual integrity, one possible interpretation is that Jacob gave his son Joseph a female garment. It doesn't have to be the definitive interpretation. It doesn't have to be the one you even agree with. But it has to be on the table because it's in the text. And if we go with that interpretation for a moment, well, suddenly the story takes on a different light. When the brothers see Joseph in public with the dress, they become irrationally violent. And yes, they've got stuff against him, but there's something about seeing him there that they flip. And they not only attack him, but they attack his garment. And if it was such a fine piece of clothing, they would have dumped his brother and somebody would have gone home wearing it. They wanted nothing to do with it. And the kind of punitive violence that's in that text reminds me of the violence I hear about today all too often about violence against transgender and genderqueer people, particularly transgender women and transgender women of color. And if you, you've been looking at the, the paper, there is routinely a story, a horrible story of a terrible murder that's just so over the top violent that not only the person is harmed, but their clothing, their accessories, their everything. How many of you have ever been to the Transgender Day of Remembrance? Please raise your hand. Thank you, thank you. This is probably one of the most important days in the queer calendar, November 20th. It is the day that we gather as a community to say the names of the people who were murdered that we know of in the past year for being gender non-conforming, for being trans. Sometimes they're gay men in drag. Often it's trans women and trans women of color. And I strongly urge you this year, November 20th, put it on your calendar, find out where it is, it will be in this area. Transgender Day of Remembrance, go. It's like going to a funeral, you go because you care. So Joseph has this experience, he's sold off as a slave, and there he's in Egypt and he is favored by everyone. And what's interesting in the Hebrew scriptures and the Muslim text, they often talk about the beauty of Joseph. He's a beautiful man, not a descriptor you often hear about men. And he does well everywhere, even in the all-male prison population. He rises to the top and he becomes second in command of the whole kingdom. And then there's moments his brothers come. And what's lovely about the structure of, of the story is you find out how like creepy and vindictive and mean and cruel his brothers are in the intervening years, and there they are all assembled. And Joseph could have so easily just like knocked them all off and just left his brother Benjamin like, screw you. But he doesn't. He acts like no other man we've seen in the scripture up until that point. He becomes the matriarch of the family. Not that a man can't be generous and loving and motherly, but we just didn't see it up until now in the text. And he becomes something other than the men around him, and therefore ultimately helped Save the people. So I think about when I was young and I was a sissy and, um, and how I hated that sissy part of me. I hated if someone could read me as a sissy because if they saw me as being not like the other boys, well then maybe they knew that I was gay. So I beat the snot out of that sissy boy. I did everything in my power to just dress up every day in a straight jacket and to try to act straight if I couldn't at least be straight. And one day I emerged out of the closet, gay. But the sissy boy was bound and gagged back in the closet, like the prophet Jeremiah dying in a well. And I needed a special ops team to let me know that it's okay for me to be me, even if it's a girly me, even if it's not like other men. And it's okay for a woman to be butch. There's strength in that. There's strength in our gender variance. We impoverish ourselves so often when we're not ourselves and we live to please other people. And so I guess my word today, not that I'm like a, a preacher and like 
I don't have a takeaway thing like most preachers do, but if I, there was a takeaway thing, what I'd like us to take away is figure out how do we embrace the gender variant part of ourselves so that we truly become fully ourselves. And not every boy was a sissy, not every girl was a tomboy that's gay and lesbian, but many of us were. How do we embrace that? And at the same token, how do we embrace people in our community who are gender nonconforming? Because I admit, as a gay man, when I first came out, I had no patience for Nellie Queens. I had no patience for drag queens. And when I first started meeting trans people, particularly trans women, I had a visceral reaction, a rejection. And I now see that that rejection was a very personal rejection because I was rejecting my own sissy self for so long, and I saw someone living authentically of themselves, openly, unashamed, and that shamed me and frightened me. And there's power in being who we are. And as I wrap up, I've got about maybe five minutes, I'd love to open up the floor to any questions or comments, if you need anything clarified of what I shared, or just have any questions about anything, I'd like to open it up for you all to, to ask those questions. Well, you know, the, the whole idea about Potiphar's wife, it's interesting, in the Joseph story, Joseph is a slave to this guy named Potiphar, and Potiphar uh, seduces him, attempts to seduce him. But what's interesting about the story, she's always kind of shown as this whorish woman who's like after young male flesh. And that's how the stories often tell. Women are not usually portrayed very well uh, in the telling of some of these stories afterwards. But if we go with the word saris, which means eunuch, well, Potiphar was a... Saris of Pharaoh's court. He was an official of Pharaoh's court. So it's possible, some scholars have said, it's possible that Potiphar was a eunuch who had a wife in that situation. He was rich, he had a wife and, and, and all, but he could not have children. So another way of looking at that story is instead of seeing her as this lascivious whore, maybe this is someone who wanted a child. And here's this person who's become part of their household and it's not just this lustful thing, but there's something else going on. It brings a little bit more depth to the story. How, uh, and these are all, we don't know for sure. So much of the Bible we don't know for sure. We just have to say, it could be this, it could be that. Uh, and, and that's an important way to hold those stories out there. Yes? He did, and he had two children who get adopted, in essence, by Jacob. They become the last two tribes of the 12 tribes of Israel. Yes? Why would Jacob give Joseph the garment? Right. It's a, it's a really... Well, it doesn't seem like he's a favorite son. It almost seems like it's the kind of, I mean, I was just in Tacoma, Washington, where I did a fundraiser for this group called My Purple Umbrella. It's a play group for transgender and gender variant children, like six, seven, eight princess boys. And so this one child from like age two was very much identifying as wanting to wear princess clothes and do all this stuff. And the parents at first were like, no, that's not going to work. That's going to be a problem. But they realized, no, this is what this child really wants. And... And they're really, we're the only person uncomfortable with this. The child's not uncomfortable with their gender. And we need to work with the school and the, play and the preschool. And, and they have. And so basically, as being a, a loving parent, they're like, well, if you really want the princess dress, if you want to wear the pink slippers to school, I'm worried. But OK, I'll talk to your teacher. We'll work it out. And I wonder if, you know, Jacob, we know that he was sensitive in the text, the clues that we have. He was not masculine like his brother. Maybe he had this girly boy son and said, it makes the kid happy. Let him, ha let him be happy. And maybe it was just to be meant worn to wear around the compound. And maybe, you know, Joseph was like, I want to wear my dress everywhere. And that created a problem. I, I don't know. But I, I think that's one possible possibility. He definitely loved his son. There's no question about that in the text. Other questions, comments? Well, then I want to end with my very favorite thing I like to do. It's my identity monologue, uh, where in two minutes, through eight characters, I tell you my life story. It's very convenient on a first date, by the way. 
and a little weird. Uh, and it's uh, still very early in the morning for me, even though it's West Coast. And so I need a little of your energy. And I need your energy in the form of a finger snap. So what I want to do, yeah, there you go. Every time I raise my right hand, I want us all to snap our fingers together at the same time. When you do that, that will release energy that I will absorb into my body, thus giving me the requisite power to miraculously transform from character to character. Let's practice our snapping, shall we? Nice, a long beach snap. Very nice. All right, I feel the energy building. Two more. And one more. I don't know why, but for much of my life, I've struggled with issues of identity. It is not just accepting myself, but even understanding who I am as a person. No, not many people, they struggle with issues of identity, particularly the younger people. No, this is bad. This is terrible. This is a catastrophe. And I remember, shoot, when I was growing up, I'd always be looking at other people to see how they live their lives. And I often wondered, what were they thinking about me? What were they saying behind my back? And as a result, I wasn't always honest about who I was. So then I tried to change all sorts of things about myself, you know, externally, the way I did my hair, the way I walked. Oh my gosh, this one time I even joined the soccer team. <laughs> Didn't make any difference. No one ever treated me better, and I never felt good about myself. Y no sé por qué, pero trataba de cambiar muchas cosas de mi vida. Gritaba al Señor, por favor, ayúdame, cámbiame, sálvame, pero sin éxito. And I understand why these issues of identity are so complicated, but for me they were. But after years of trials and tribulations, I finally came to the place where I understood who I was, and I accepted myself. So now I can say thank you very much. Although the process of self-discovery is a very difficult process, it is a very important process all the same. And now when I look at myself in the mirror, and I see other people out and about, I often say to myself, are the most beautiful people in the world and the most powerful are those people who are unashamed just to be themselves.